Uh, my name is Nyaradzai Mutiwanyuka. Nyaradzai means comfort, and Mutiwanyuka means um, the tree that that sprung up. So I was born in Zimbabwe in Bulawayo. It's uh, the second largest city in Zimbabwe. Um, many many years ago. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so Bloweo is, like I said, it's the small, it's, not, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the second largest um, town in Zimbabwe and the native language is Ndebele, um, but I am Shona, so my, my dad was there for work and um, that's where we mostly grew up in, in Bloweo. I speak, I speak Shona, I understand Ndebele. Um, but yeah, Ndebele is not my native language, but I, because I grew up in that area, I kind of understand a bit. So growing up, um, we lived in Hillside, which was one of the s suburbs in, in Bloweo. Um, uh, but when, when I was born, we lived in the locations. So I was born before the independence. So we lived in Luveve. That's where my parents lived. Um, I'm not sure what the house looked like because I was, like I said, I was born there. <laughs> so I was a bit too young to, and I don't think my dad's got any pictures. I've not seen any. Um, but at the time, that's when um, we had um, what, what is referred to as apartheid. Although most people know apartheid as being something that's in, in South Africa, we also had it in Zimbabwe, just, just that it wasn't as prevalent or as known, I suppose. Um, so black Zimbabweans could not live in certain areas. Uh, so we were sort of like in the location or in the sort of lesser, lesser well-built areas, if you like. <clears throat> uh, so that, so that's, that was then. And then obviously independence happened and um, we then moved to the suburbs, um, which is obviously a, a bigger, bigger area with a swimming pool and all sorts. So yeah, I was there for... I came when I was 26, so I was there quite quite a bit. <laughs> uh, so I did my, I went to kindergarten, then went to, you know, primary school, high school, uh, went to college, and then worked a little bit before I came to the UK. My kindergarten was at St. Gabriel's, um, it was in Bloweo, uh, and then we moved to, to Harare, which is like the largest um, city in Zimbabwe. Uh, we were there for about three years. It wasn't long, but that's when I started my um, grade one, <laughs> as we call it. So that's where I started my grade one. Um, and we were there for th two and a half years, like from, for, so I was there for until uh, grade three, but halfway through we moved back to Bloweo. Um, so that was, that was an interesting time for me uh, in school. I remember um, because, like I said, I, I speak Shona, and um, in school, one of the lessons, you know, grade one, is learning Shona. Um, and, but then they, uh, Shona has different dialects, um, you know, so, so for example, a cat in Harare would be Kiti, whereas a cat in my language would be uh, Kiti. So I remember, so without the S, so, <laughs> so I remember my uh, Shona teacher, um, you know, she was trying to teach us all these words and I was like, this is not what I know. So I, I walked out of class, this was in grade one, walked out of class and went and sat in the uh, playground. Um, and, and I remember her coming to me and saying, you know, like, you know, what's going on? And the parents were called and stuff like that. And I was like, this, this is not, this, she, I don't know, she doesn't know what she's doing. <laughs> Um, but yeah, in the end, I kind of understood that, you know, like I have to be in school because I had a telling off from my parents and stuff. Um, yeah, so that was sort of my earlier years, uh, introduction to, to learning. And then we moved to Bloweo, where I was at an all-girls school um, up until high school, so up until my A-levels. I was at the same school from grade three. Um, yeah, so that was, that was interesting. Um, it was a Catholic school uh, run by nuns. Um, like I said, all girls. All the nuns were from Germany. Go figure. Um, <laughs> and then we had the only black teachers were, as you would guess, the vernacular teachers that would teach Ndebele or Shona or whatever it may be. Um, 
yeah, so that was that was interesting. Yeah, when I went to college, it was it was mixed. So that was sort of my first time learning with 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 men or boys. Um, I was nineteen then, um, so that was it was it was a very interesting transition, um, learning to navigate that space. Um, but I think I held because, like I said, I'd, I'd been at convent since I was you know, grade three, which is what, um, how old would that be? Eight up until, you know, 18. So, um, and because like I said, it was quite a, a Catholic school, Christian, so I had all these ideals and, you know, um, so when I went to, to college, it was more of, it was a culture shock to see how other people dealt with, you know, that space of having boys there and everyone was boy crazy. And I was like, oh, I don't know what's going on here. And, you know, yeah, so there was a bit of, um, a culture shock for me in that respect um, and that, you know I, I was there to learn and that that was my assignment in my head um, but slowly but surely I did I did get some male friends and stuff like that and started to sort of learn a bit more about how men work <laughs> if you like <laughs> at the time I never thought to leave Zim um, things were still okay in terms of like the economy, in terms of uh, future prospects, career prospects. Um, there, wasn't, there wasn't a thought in my head to, th to think I could go elsewhere. Although um, my brother and sister who are older than me had gone to university in South Africa. Um, so my dad, um, <clears throat> my dad uh, was, uh, you know, he worked in a, in a big company as a, as a top executive, so he was able to send them to these, you know, outside of the country for university. Um, but when it came to my turn after I left A-levels, my dad lost his job. Um, so I ended up going to like a local college in, in, in we'd moved, by then we'd already moved from um, um, Blauea to another city, a smaller town. Um, so I went to college instead. Um, so apart from that, just the the jealousy of thinking, oh, why couldn't I also go, you know, to, to another to another country for learning? I never thought to move for work. It was more, you know, maybe I could go elsewhere for learning, but not necessarily to live or to start a new life. Like I said, I was at college, so I was studying. I was studying accounting, um, and when I finished. Um, my dad managed to, to, I don't know, you know, he's got connections, he had connections, managed to, to get me an interview with a, a non-governmental organization in Zimbabwe, um, and I got the job. Um, so my first real job, I mean, I'd had other jobs in between, you know, being, you know, as, as people do in college, um, but my first real paid proper job, <laughs> uh, I was an administrator um, with an NGO, um, managing of a, a, a few people, um, yeah. So that was my first job. When 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 I started my my first job, I then moved to another. It was the same NGO, so it's like a franchise. So they had the same name, but I moved from that the, the, that first one to another town called Motare, uh, where my sister was, because I was feeling lonely in, in you know in, in, the, in the small town that I was in, and I was like, oh, I might as well move to you know South. Uh, uh, you know, they had a job going similar to what I was doing, so I went there, you know, interviewed for it and got the job. Uh, so I moved to Mutari and I was living with my sister and her son at the time. Um, and when I was in that position, everything was fine up until like 2000, uh, I'd say 2002, 2003, around there. Um, that's when, you know, um, my salary was like, because I worked in human resources, so I was sort of like responsible for the payroll, for, for everyone in the, in the organization. <clears throat> and every month we were looking at, you know, like we're increasing people's pay by a certain percentage. So like I started off, my salary was 2,500 at the time, uh, uh, Zim dollars. Uh, by the time I left to come here, I was at 120 something. And that was because of inflation. Um, and with that 120 something, I couldn't, I couldn't afford to, to not, not that I couldn't afford, but it was more of, you got to, once you get paid, you had to buy all your things that day, or at least within that week, pay off all your bills, or your whatever it is, because in the second week, things may go up again. <laughs> 
so you may not be able to afford to buy it or whatever. Um, so thing, it just got so bad, um, and my brother had moved. Um, so he was, when he finished uh, uni, because he's a year older than me, so he was studying in South Africa, like I mentioned. So when he finished uni, he got a job in South Africa, and then when he finished, so his job was, I don't know, maybe about a year or so, and then he applied to come to the UK. So he was here already, and then he said to me, why don't you come over? Um, I think it'll be a good idea, blah, 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 you know, as the story goes, and that's how I, I'm, I um, ended up here, <laughs> basically. At the time, um, Zimbabwe had its own airline. We still kind of do, but it doesn't fly to the UK anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, because we couldn't afford to pay, the, the government couldn't afford to pay the, um, I don't know what, what sort of rental fees, or I don't know what it is that they pay at the, at the at Gatwick for the, for the airline to land, so they couldn't afford to pay that. So the airline stopped going directly to the UK, but at the time when I, when I got on, it was a direct flight, um, so that was about eight hours. Um, but it was, it was a good flight. Um, I was looking forward to it. Um, and I was, I was, I remember when I got to the, when I was checking in and the lady said, oh, I'm going to put you in business class. And I was, I had no idea what that meant in terms of, <laughs> you know, she just upgraded me, I guess. Um, so I didn't know what that meant. Like, I, you know, to, I, it was my first time on a, on an international airline. I'd been sort of like domestic flights, but not necessarily international. Um, so I didn't know what that meant. So I was just like, okay. So I got into the airline, into the thing and, you know, enjoyed the flight there. Um, I wasn't too concerned about getting to the, to the, uh, what you call it, to the immigration and stuff like that, because um, th um, we, I think, I can't remember when it was that it changed, but we were getting visas now. To, to come in so it wasn't like a chance it kind of thing maybe I'll get there maybe they might deport me kind of thing it was like you've got your visa everything's approved at the British Embassy in Zimbabwe so you're guaranteed to go in it wasn't like you know so I knew I was going to get in anyway yeah so I wasn't too concerned about that it was very difficult for me to get the visa um the, the requirements had changed it wasn't as simple as you know you just have to have money in your wallet you had to to get um, like um, from your current employer, you had to get a letter to say you'll be coming back um, because, because now the visa that I applied for was a visitor's visa, um, which is what most people were now applying for. Um, and the idea was that once I got here, I would then change to a student visa, um, which, is, which was still, a, at, at the time, that's what people were now doing. Um, but to get the visa, the, the requirements were quite, there was quite a lot of them. And also, um, they had started to limit the number of people applying for visas per day. So the queue outside of the embassy would start like at 2 a.m. in the morning and would go all the way, all the way around the building. And I think they were taking about 200 applications per day. So the first time I queued up, I missed it by like 10 people. So there were 10 people in front of me. So uh, my sister and I were like, oh, what do we do? So we, we managed to, to hire someone to, to, <laughs> to get there at 2 a.m. because we got there a bit later the first day. So the second day we're like, okay, we're gonna hire someone to sleep there because that's what people were doing um, from 2 a.m. and then we'll get there at six um, and then take over and stuff like that. And that's how I managed to get in and hand in all my paperwork and have a little mini interview and, and stuff like that. And um, yeah, and I got the visa there and then as well. Like I said, it was leaving everything I knew. I'd never lived outside of Zimbabwe. I'd, I'd visited countries outside of Zimbabwe. Um, um, even for work, I'd been outside of the country. So it wasn't, you know, I had traveled. So it wasn't like it was something new to me. But this was now, so I think in my head, I was still thinking, um, I was going to come back. Uh, that, was, that was the idea. I think most Zimbabweans had that idea that, you know, we're just going to go for a couple of years, work, and, you know, and go back home because um, the economy wasn't that great and, you know, we just thought that maybe at some point the government would change and, you know, we, we would, you know, would get back to where we were pre-2008. Um, 
not 2008, 2000 and, was it 1990? Oh, I can't remember what year it was when everything just went hoo-ha. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, like, you know, so there was an expectation that things would change. Um, so, yeah, coming here, I don't think I'll be here this long, 19 years down the line. <laughs> um, but um, in terms of expectations, like many people, I'd seen TV shows um, and stuff like that. And I thought coming out of the airport, the first thing I'd probably see was, not the first thing, but you know, I didn't think that the first thing I'd see was nothing. <laughs> Basically, you know, you'd see like a whole big car park or whatever it was and, and then drive out and then there's absolutely nothing, especially on the M25. You can barely see anything, you know, and yeah, so. I thought that, you know, coming out, you'd probably see the Big Ben and you'd see all, the, <laughs> all this other stuff. And obviously that didn't happen. Um, so my brother, unfortunately, um, he was, he's, he's, he's a surveyor. So he was at work. Um, his, his job sometimes takes him away from home. So when I arrived, he was, he was actually away from home. So he couldn't take me straight to Nottingham. So he took me to my aunt's house in Eastham. East Ham, East Ham, um, which is in London. Um, so I was there for two weeks while he was doing his, his work bits and then he came, came by to pick me up. So in that first, so, so in the first week I was determined, I was like, I need to see what England is all about because you know, I had this perception. So in the first, I had a bit of money with me as well. So I was like, got on the tube, you know, I was quite, I, I guess I was, I, was, I, was a, I was a bit more alert and a bit more streetwise, if you like, if that's the word. Um, so I got on the tube, but unfortunately with my streetwiseness, I uh, got on the wrong tube in terms of direction. So I, I knew the tube I wanted to get, but I got the one that was going the opposite way. So I, I was like, no, not this one. So I got off of the next stop and then got the one that was going in the right direction. Um, so I went into central London. Um, took loads of pictures of, you know, all the iconic bits that I was, I had the perception of. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I like this, you know, this is, this is what I came for <laughs> and stuff like that. And because I knew that my brother didn't live in London and I was like, I don't know when I'll be next back in London after coming to Nottingham. So I was like, I need to, to get it out of my system and see it now. Um, yeah, so I took quite a few pictures in, in London, of Tower Bridge, uh, London Eye, Trafalgar Square, all that stuff. Um, so that was my first two, three days after the nap. And then my uh, cousin said, well, we got to get you to work now. And I was like, what? <laughs> so in my first, uh, I think on the, f the fourth day, she took me to a, to a um, what do you call it? A an agency that was doing catering and got me a job at a university CAF, I think it was at the time. And I remember the first day I went to work, um, I think that must have been on the Friday or something like that, because I did a whole week at this job um, on the Friday. And I, I struggled because it was, I had to, because the lady was like, so, so have you worked on the tills yet? Yes, I have. Yeah, I've worked on the tills. I had never worked on the tills. But um, I struggled with the money, the money aspect. I don't know if you've ever been to a different country and you're trying to figure out like, what is this 20p what you know what kind of yeah so you know like people coming in and I'm supposed to have worked I'm supposed to know what I'm looking at and the lady was looking at me like why is she looking at the money like you know trying to give change and stuff and I don't want to obviously short change the the till um but lucky enough not many people came through um because I arrived in September so I think unis were still starting to open up and stuff like that so there weren't many people not many students, so I think that's that's how I got lucky in that in that respect. Um, but yeah, so that was sort of my first perception of it. I'll tell you one major shock, which was, which which is a bit funny to me now when I think about it. But um, in most countries, I've realised now after travelling that this is the case in most countries apart from the UK. So cheese and onion is green in most countries. It's blue in the UK. <laughs> Salt and vinegar is blue in, 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 in Zimbabwe. So anyway, I walked in and I wanted a cheese and onion packet and I just picked up the green one. And I, I, didn't, I didn't read it, I just thought it's cheese and onion. Um, 
And then when I opened it, I was like, and I hate for the salt, the salt and vinegar with the passion. <laughs> so I was so annoyed. I was so annoyed with that. And I was like, I've already spent my money. And at the time, obviously, you're still counting the pennies. This was, I was still in London at the time. I think it was on my second or third day. I can't remember. But yeah, so that was a, a big shock to me coming in. I was like, okay, I'll never do that again. <laughs> I think when we got when we got to the my, my brother lived in an apartment um but it wasn't the best <laughs> it wasn't the best it was a, a council apartment um and i was yeah I, I, uh, <laughs> it wasn't the best i'll tell you that for for sure um um, and I remember he gave me the, the larger room. He was like, you know, um, I'll take the small room, etc., because it was a two two bed apartment, and um, the floorboards were exposed, and they weren't the best floorboards. I know nowadays people are like, oh, you have floorboards, send them down, and all sorts. But these were not the kind of floorboards boards that you'd want to to have exposed. Um, yeah, so that was that was that was interesting for me. Um, sort of thinking, okay, so this is this is this life, you know, kind of thing. Um, but apart from that, um, I then started, I can't remember how I, I, what job I then, I can't remember what my first job here in, 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 in Nottingham was, um, but I, I understood that I had to, to get something going <coughs> and uh, within a week I was working somewhere. I work in the civil service. <laughs> I'm a civil servant. Um, I work in bankruptcies. So yeah, so that's that's kind of like my my line of work. Um, I don't know. I I enjoy it kind of. You know, it's it's different. Um, but prior to that, so I started working there in 2018. But prior to that, I'd been doing a lot of uh, care work. Um, I did try to get into sort of admin type or, you know, something else different, but um, I don't know. I don't know whether it was because of the job or the people that I worked with. I didn't, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't enjoy working in that kind of environment. I think, I think cause it was a corporate private sector, sorry, private sector. So I didn't enjoy that. Um, working in the civil service is so much more different. Um, everyone is friendly, everyone wants to help you, everyone's supportive. Um, whereas in the private sector, I think each man for himself. So it's kind of like, um, yeah, and then there's also that pressure to perform targets and stuff like that. And if you're different, it, you, you notice it immediately that you're being tif treated differently. Um, so yeah, whereas the civil service is more accepting and inclusive. I saw myself as a high flyer, jet setting, somebody doing something, but I, I just could never pinpoint because um, when I was in college, I did accounting, like I mentioned, but that was my dad's, um, that's what he wanted me to do, right? So, I, and he's an accountant. Um, that's, that's his main thing before he sort of developed, you, you know how careers develop. You can start off as one thing and then you go into this, that and the other. So he, that's what he wanted me to do. So I did accounting. Um, and I mean, I, I enjoyed it for, most, for the most part, but I didn't feel like it was me. Um, and I feel like I'm more of a creative person. I'm more of a person that likes to talk to people, work with people rather than numbers. Um, um, yeah, so at the moment, I'm kind of looking into project management. That's kind of like the direction that I want to go into. I think I, I have in my head, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a what, what do they call it? A, a jack of all trades, master of none kind of person. And um, I, I feel like there's so many things that I want to do that are creative. I mean, I've got so many videos that I've recorded. That I, I, I've got a YouTube channel. I've got a few videos up there, but the last one I posted was two years ago because I'm just too lazy to edit. But um, yeah, so the, you know, it's 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 one of those things. I've 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 I've, I've uh, when I was in school, like in, in high school, I did fashion and fabrics. Um, 
you know, uh, my granddad is the one who introduced me into sewing and stuff like that because he had he was a tailor and he had a sewing machine. And every time I went to visit him in the rural areas, he would be sitting there with a the sewing machine and I'll be looking and watching him. Um, so, so that's kind of like something that I've always been interested in, which is, um, and I did that at um, O level, fashion, no, A level, sorry, no, oh God. Uh, what was it called? Uh, ZJC, which is like a <laughs> form two kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I did fashion and fabrics then. Um, and then I bought myself a sewing machine recently. Um, I had I had a mini mini one which doesn't really which didn't really do much uh, and that broke and then I bought a new one a sophisticated one last year for my birthday um, which I still haven't opened see that's another thing that I, <laughs> because I'm just I don't know I don't know what what I'm waiting for but um, it's yeah so you know there's there's quite a lot of things that I like to do creatively but and having met uh, my husband who's a filmmaker. Um, I've found that an interesting thing as well. So I'm, I'm sort of like part of his videos. I, I you know, I'm sort of executive produce some of the stuff <laughs> and sort of give him a bit of, um, you know, tips and he asks me questions on what he thinks about this, that and the other. So there's that aspect of it as well. And I, and I enjoy, you know, being part of that, that, that aspect of his life. Um, but in terms of like project management, it, it, it can be looked at as a creative uh, career in, in, in the fact that, you know, you, you're building something, you're work, working towards something, you're working with other people. So, you know, so there's, there, there's that aspect of it as well, but it's more, you know, you have to find, you have to find something that pays the bills. <laughs> yeah. I would I would say that watching my granddad was something that sparked my creativity. Yes, um, because after watching him, because he had this machine, right, the sewing machine, that you'd use your feet to propel the, to propel right, to propel the, the 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 thing to sew, right. So that 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 in itself was like wow, and then I remember then sort of like thinking about it, and then I was like, well, my mom's got a sewing machine. She used to sew as well. So, so she had a sewing machine, but hers was electric. So it didn't do all those fancy things that I saw my granddad doing. Um, but I wanted to learn on his because of that aspect, you know. Um, so afterwards, you know, I, I kind of got into watching my mom as well when we then got home and stuff like that. Um, and then got myself into, like I mentioned, fashion and fabrics. While everyone else, I think there was only, if, if I remember correctly, there was, in my class, there were 32 students. Um, like I said, it was all girls. So there were 32 students and you were offered either uh, cooking, I can't remember what the actual thing was, cooking or fashion and fabrics. Fashion and fabrics had five people and the rest <laughs> were in cooking. And I remember um, like halfway through, you'd hear the, you know, you could smell all the food and you'd be like, oh, I wish I did cooking, you know. But at the end of the day, you know, I was happy with what I did anyway, with the choices I made. Nottingham does not have, um, uh, places that I could go for Zimbabwean food, like um, like an actual menu of Zimbabwean food. There have been people who've tried, but it ends up being more of a social gathering type, drinking, beer type thing. Um, and it's very limited in what they offer. So they'll offer maybe three things on the menu. Um, one is sadza, which looks kind of like fufu. I don't know if people know what that is, but so you would have sadza, then you might have borovos and meat, which I think a lot of people have, and then vegetables. So that's what that's the thing that you'd probably get from the, the Zimbabwean places that are around Nottingham. I think I think at the minute there are about two that I know of. Um, but in terms of an actual restaurant where you can go and you know have a menu and a, and a, a variety of things on there, I can't think of any that have tried to do it. There's not many Zimbabweans in Nottingham, I think, to fuel that or to make it profitable for people um, and it's sad to say that you know not it's not just Zimbabwean food I mean the, I can't think of a Nigerian place I can't think of you know I think uh, Jamaican yes um, but I can't think of any other sort of like African places that we that, that but I do we as as you know as, as a couple we do like to visit places that are unique 
different in terms of food that offer food choices. So, you know, you, you'll, if you find me at, say, Pizza Express, you, you should question me why I'm there. <laughs> uh, you know, so we like to do like Lebanese or anything that's different, anything that's, that's not burgers and chips or whatever else. Um, but yeah, I think it's something that it would be good if, if, if we had African food somewhere, or if we can have like a restaurant where it's like different foods, you know, I mean, like when, when we have festivals, I think some people do have that, but it's, it's few and far between, like carnival type things, you know, yeah, but apart from that, no, no, <laughs> no, 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 cooking is not my forte, um, although I do enjoy cooking, but it's not my forte. Over the years, I have been to quite a few sort of like, you know, like, you know, you have Independence Day. Every country does. Every country does. And, you know, you try to celebrate that. Ours is on the 18th of April um, where, you know, we, we got our independence from the British. Um, and there's usually events happening within Nottingham. Um, but for the last sort of six or seven years, I haven't really been... But um, they are, it's, it's, not, it's never really something regular, like in terms of community, but I do know a lot of Zimbabweans in Nottingham. Um, and, you know, I try to, to connect with people. I try to, 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 to sort of just see Zimbabweans around and just to have that, that feeling of home um which is which is always important um the church i go to there's loads of zimbabweans there um and, and i love i love it for for my church um it wasn't always like that um i remember when i when i first joined but slowly but surely you know we're getting a, a few people in there um so it's 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 just good to see that there's there's few zimbabweans out there that you can i can connect with in terms of community um but in terms of like a regular thing that's happening within the Zimbabwean community, uh, there isn't much really, um, apart from the two restaurants that I've, I, or places, should I say, that I have heard of. Um, it would be good, yes, to see more of um, a Zimbabwean community, uh, something more regular that, that happens, somewhere, something that you could be like on a Saturday, maybe once a month or once every two months, it doesn't have to be every day because I know it's, it's quite draining. Like I said, there's not many Zimbabweans in Nottingham, so trying to keep something going can be exhausting. Yeah. Back in 2003, when I first came to, to the UK, um, the scene then, for me, um, I was more about, and, and, and I think a lot of Zimbabweans, and maybe even a lot of Africans, because I met quite a few people in, 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 in the work, workspace, it was all about work, 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 and nothing but work. You know, you'd, you'd come from a shift, you'd rest, go to a shift, rest, come back. Do you know what I mean? Like, because I think at the time, our perceptions was um, get money, uh, raise money, and go home kind of thing, you know, um, save enough to go home. Um, but as time moved on, and, you know, personally, I realized that this was never going to change. Like in Zimbabwe, what was happening? The economy was just getting worse. Uh, people were complaining. People needed me to be here in terms of sending money home. Um, so I stayed here longer than I, than I thought I would. I mean, I'm still here, obviously. But, um, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I then started to look at like uni stuff and, you know, and, and, and settling. And, and, that, and I think that's when I kind of just said, well, this is not home. And also another aspect of it was um, when I was in Zimbabwe, I was, I was diagnosed with a thyroid problem, right? So I got a, a, a what do you call it? Surgery, right, done. And then when I came, when I came here in 2009, no, 2008, because um, I used to go to my, my, my um, GP for regular visits, um, they found out that certain things, you know, the, the, the surgery hadn't gone well or, you know, they, they'd taken out an aspect of um, it's something that produces calcium within my body. So when they were doing the bloods, they were like, how have you lived for so long without calcium supplements? Because your calcium is so low. And I remember 
the day because I had gone, I'd gone shopping with my um, my cousin's wife, and we were in Primark, and my doctor called me, and uh, she was like, "You need to go to the hospital now." I'm like, "What?" And she was like, "I'm shopping. I'm fine. I, I don't I don't understand what she's on about." She was like, "You need to go now." And I remember we, you know, we obviously left, and I went and checked myself into um, City Hospital. And and everyone was just like, how have you lived with such a low, you know, um, Im Im uh, calcium levels? So I was on a drip for a week for calcium, um, and I was I was in the hospital for for a week. Um, and since then, I've been on, you know, um, thyroid medicine as well as calcium level uh, medication. And in a way, I, I you know that that was the other thing that sort of made me think, well. I can't really go to Zimbabwe now because, you know, there's certain things like healthcare is not that great in Zim, um, and all the other things compounded all together. It's just it just doesn't make sense to go back. Um, so that was the other thing that kind of made me think. Well, I'm I'm here now. You know, I'm I'm getting the medical treatment I need as well as um, the the money that people need back home to send and stuff like that. So yeah, so I, I started getting into uni and. Um, did my master's and um, that's when I tried to get into private uh, <laughs> private work, uh, what you call it, private sector work and I was like, no. Um, and then I went back to care, uh, but in care I sort of changed and I was doing occupational therapy. Um, but then I, I then thought, you know what, let me try civil service and that's when I then got the job to do. At the time, because um, I hadn't, in my head, I hadn't processed exactly um, that. It, I didn't think of it as a barrier, you know, um, until I, I had that, 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 that stint in the hospital. Because prior to that, I remember calling my sister and I'd be just crying, like, why am I here? Why am I here? I need to go home. I need, I need to be home, etc. cetera. And, and then I remember thinking to myself, this is why I'm here, because... If I wasn't here, I'd probably be dead in Zim. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or maybe not dead, I don't know, but I could be in a worse position. I could be, sh I, I don't know. You know, you just don't know. You can't predict the, you know, the, the past or whatever it may be. But, um, you know, so that it kind of it kind of made me think that maybe that's why I'm, I am here. And it kind of brought a bit of peace in my head to think, you know, God had me here to sort of say, look, yeah, for a reason. My family was very supportive during that period. Um, and um, I remember my brother, my older brother, he was really, really worried because he, he just didn't know what to what to do because he felt like, oh, God, I brought her here. And, you know, because he, he felt quite responsible because at that time, uh, my younger brother had also moved by then. He, he, he had also moved to, to the UK. So there's three of us here in Nottingham. Um, so, yeah very supportive. When I came to the UK, um, like I said, the intention was to, to change my visa from a visitor's visa to student visa. At the time, the internet was, wasn't great. Um, there, there was not much access. I mean, even here, most people would go to an ca um, internet cafe. So it wasn't like on your phone or anything like that. So you can imagine in Zimbabwe, it wasn't readily available either. So um, on the 30th of Oct August, they changed, the, the British government changed everything and said that you can't, once you come here on a visitor's visa, you can't change to student visa. I'd already got my visa, right? And I was flying on the 7th of September. So this is August into September. So my flight was on the 7th, like a week later. So when I arrived um, and I was now trying to change to a student visa, um, I was told you can't do that, right? So. I, I was like, you know, like I sent, I sent this to the home office. I said, look, da, 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 and they were like, no, 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 no. You know, we changed the rules on the 30th. That's it. You can't. You have to go back to your home country in order to, 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 to what you call it, to, to come back on a student visa. So I was like, oh, well, that's not going to happen because obviously my brother had spent all this money for me to come here, and he wasn't. At the time, he was a stu um, uh, what you call it, like a, a junior surveyor. So he wasn't getting paid a lot, but he was still okay, and he was obviously supporting me and supporting um, the family as well back home. So he couldn't afford for me to go back and then buy another air ticket and stuff like that. And I had, um, I had 
at that time. I hadn't told my workplace, you know, because <laughs> I think it's a common theme. You know, you, you just come and then once you're in, you're like, then you call them and say, yo, um, I've left. <laughs> you know, I'm resigning from work now. Um, so, no, I hadn't told, I had already told them that, you know, like I'm resigning, I'm here and etc. So I didn't have a work, a job to go back to. Um, so fast forward uh, to 2009. So I, I went into sort of like a, legal battle with the Home Office up until 2009. So during that period, I, I registered for uni as an international student, but it was all online uh, with the University of Liverpool. So that's how I, I did my master's degree because I couldn't, I couldn't go into uni as a, someone who was here. Um, so you, know, you could apply from anywhere in the world as an international student, so I was applying in Nottingham. Uh, but my university was the University of Liverpool, and that's where I got my master's. Um, but it was all online, online classes, um, etc. Yes, yeah, so, so 2009, that's when I got my, um, I, I won my case with the Home Office. Um, and, well, I, I wouldn't say I won, but uh, the Labour Party decided to do like a, do, 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 what's it called? Amnesty was called amnesty at the time and they granted a lot of visas to Zimbabweans I don't know if, to, if this applied to other countries but I know a lot of Zimbabweans that I knew in the community all got their visas at that time but it was all indefinitely if to remain um, and when my lawyer was sort of saying to me look this is what you've got and because uh, when you came you didn't break your there wasn't a period where you weren't in communication with the Home Office. You're considered as if you've been here for that length of time. So it's not like you've started, you know, um, as you got your visa. So basically I'd served that length of time. And my amnesty was due to the fact that I, I was very active in my church at the time. I was volunteering at the time and I... Um, there were other things that I, I did, so it was like so they needed to see like evidence of that to say that you know you're active in your community, you're doing things and etc. Um, so I showed them all that, and they granted me the um, indefinite leave to remain uh, in two thousand and nine, and then I then applied for a British citizenship in two thousand and fifteen. I think it was. It was definitely a hard process because um, when I was speaking to my sister. Um, you know, on the phone and I'll be crying like, why am I still here? I could just come home, you know, because obviously I don't have papers. Um, I can't really work. Um, but, you know, I couldn't sort of do what I wanted to do at the time. Um, so it, it definitely was a hard process for me. And it was, it, was, it was made harder by the fact that some people that I saw were advancing that I'd come with or, you know, like we're in the sort of similar sphere. They were doing things and, and buying houses and, you know, and I was just stuck in limbo. Um, so that, yeah, so it was, it was quite hard to, to imagine and to see. My decision to get the British citizenship um, was, it wasn't easy because obviously I'm Zimbabwean first, in my head anyway. <laughs> Even though now, now technically I've lived half and half, but in my head at the time I was like, well, I am Zimbabwean. Is that like kind of denouncing my Zimbabwean-ness for British, Britishness, you know what I mean? But um, I remember my aunt had, she, she had lived, she had come just like two years before me and she, 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 she at the time was a nurse. She's retired now and she's gone back to Zim. Um, but she was like, you know, why don't you just get a British passport and then we can travel together and stuff like that. Because she, she lived on her own at the time. And, she, you know, she wanted a travel buddy, so to speak. And I was, it, kind of, it kind of then made me think twice that, you know, it's, it, it's, it's an advantage in, in, its, in itself. And it may be an advantage in getting jobs as well to sort of have a British passport, who knows. Um, and dual citizenship is something that's allowed, I guess, um, although Zimbabweans are a bit mm, about it. But um, yeah, so the process for me was, it was, it was straightforward at the time. Um, I didn't find it difficult per se. Um, I applied and, it took about a year 
in terms of in terms of getting a response. But um, when I I can't remember where I got this number from. There was a number um, in my phone that said Brian Home Office. So I, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to call this number. And I said, you know, like, look, um, I've been waiting this long for for my papers to come through and what what's happening. And he kind of looked into the system and he was like, OK, I'll, I'll get it sorted out for you. And within a week, you know, I got my, um, my British citizenship or at least the allowance to sort of say, um, you know, you can now go and pledge allegiance to the Queen and country and stuff like that. Um, so I got that through and then I went, I, I had to book an appointment at the city council house. <laughs> um, I had to book a, a, an appointment at the council house um, and I went there. Um, I went there with, with a friend that, um, that I'd known and so it was just myself and, and him. And we, I remember, I remember the, them asking sort of like, do you want to pledge allegiance to, everyone had to pledge allegiance to the queen, but you know, the, the question was, do you want to, to say, you want to pledge allegiance to, to, to God and, or do you want to leave that out? And I was like, well, you know, pledge allegiance, you know, have God in, in, the, in, the, in the thing. Um, so when I was there, I was sort of like looking around to see like, they had, they had two sections, so the people that were pledging allegiance to the Queen and God and those who were just pledging allegiance to the Queen. And, um, and then, I, you know, and I was thinking, but I don't know why I thought that everyone would, but then I, then I was like, oh, yeah, because there's different nationalities, there's different religions, there's people who don't believe in God, etc. So I suppose they were given the option to, 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 yeah, to pledge only to the Queen, but everyone had to pledge to the Queen because, you know, if you're going to be British, that's... That's how you do it, but um, and it, it was a fair, it, it was a non-event to be honest with you. It didn't feel. I mean, I felt like okay, it's done now. But then at the same time, I didn't feel like woohoo, you know, because I you still have to put, you still have to put in the work to get things done and stuff like that. So in terms of like jobs and stuff, it's not like an automatic. Here you go. Um, so, the, you know, you still have to, to work hard. Yeah. And then obviously once, once I got that done, I then applied for a British passport. Um, and since then I've, you know, I've enjoyed traveling <laughs> because, uh, with my uh, Zimbabwean passport, um, you need visas to go to every other country outside of the, outside of the, outside of the UK. Um, and that is a process in itself. One, it's obviously, you know, you spend money to get the visa and then you have to go to the embassy, you have to travel down to London and, and stuff like that. So it's quite a bit of a process, whereas with a British passport, obviously now there's Brexit, so I don't know how that works, but you could just wake up one morning and think, oh, I want to go on holiday and done. Yeah, so I experienced racism, I feel, um, within working within a, like nursing homes and stuff like that. Um, the older generation, you know, the, there were some people that would call you names um, or would say, I don't want that black person or, do you know what I mean? Like, so you, you, you would get that. Um, and then also working with white people sometimes, you know, you, you, you would give you'd be given the, the the lesser work so to speak and then they'll they'll do the the stuff that was interesting or that wasn't as taxing as it were so at the end of the shift you'd be knackered because you've done all the lifting and the 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 heavy work if you like um so you know so i don't know if i'd call that racism that bit but you know like with the older people some of them were quite blatantly racist um and then when the Black Lives Matter thing, and I remember <laughs> I remember this one time when I was looking for a job and um, my pastor at the time said to me, can I look at your CV? So I, I showed him my CV and it had my name on it. Um, you know, Nyaradzai Mutiwanyuka. And I was like, whoo, that's a mouthful. And I said, well, yeah, that's, that's my name. But then he was like, but you've got the C in the middle. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's Clarietta. That's my middle name. And I was like, why don't you use that instead, um, you know, and, and get this one off? Because people will look at your CV and they can't pronounce it and they'll probably bin it. And I was like, oh, OK. You know, so that was, I hadn't thought about it because, you know, that's my name. Um, 
So that was sort of like the first sort of thing that made me think, oh, okay, so this actually happens. Um, so that was one thing that I did and um, took that off the CV and put, you know, Clarietta or Claire, as some people would, would then call me. And that's, you know, some people started calling me Claire for quite a long time um, within the workspace. Um, but then when I moved to the civil service, I, I was specific. I said, I don't want to be called Claire. <laughs> well, they didn't know anyway, because they asked you, you know, like, what's your preferred name? So I, you know, I, I said Nyari, which is the shortened version. Most people call me Nya or Nyari anyway, um, regardless of, of you know, uh, whether they can say Nyaradzai or not. Um, so, yeah, so I, I haven't used Claire since I started this new job. Um, but in terms of um, Black Lives Matter, Ah, <sighs> that was heavy. That was heavy. Oh, God, 2020 was something else. It didn't help that we were in lockdown. We were already as stressed as it was with COVID and stuff like that. Um, and I remember both myself and my husband, we were just, I wouldn't say stressed, but it was just so overwhelming. And... At one point, we were like, we, I don't even want to... I, I still haven't watched that video of George Floyd. I haven't. I've watched... I, I kind of wa started watching, and I was like, no, I don't want to watch it anymore, and I stopped. So I have never, I've never watched it um, to, in its entirety. Um, one, because I've seen similar anyway. Um, two, I know what happens in the end. Um, so... You know, so it's kind of like, I don't want to watch it. I know what's happened. He's gone and it was racist and that's it, full stop. And we, when on the 7th of June, there was like a march in Nottingham uh, by the forest fields and my husband and I went and we did a small little video of it. It's on YouTube if you want to access it. Um, and yeah, we took some images and we did like a voiceover of, of how we felt about that day. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was so hard. It was so hard. I, I work with a group in, in my workplace, which is a, a ethnic minority uh, group within, within, within the department that I work in. Um, and we had that conversation in the group, like, why is our senior leaders, why are they not saying anything and what's happening and what, you know, and we had to prompt them to say something like, to to uh, to everyone, you know, to say like, look, this is not right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, it, it kind of felt like we were being ignored, if if anything, um, and then people only kind of woke up to it in terms of um, companies and everyone else. Or I, I'm not sure about the city itself because I, I don't think I I had a look at what they were doing. But in terms of like companies and stuff like that, I remember people on Instagram sort of saying, you know, oh, this company is now putting a black square, but they're not really doing anything. Do you know what I mean? Like, so people wanted to make it look like they were doing something, but I don't think, um, the, the, with some people, I don't think the, um, the um, intention was, was genuine. Um, but I remember, um, at church, they did do like a like a series on it, um, a video, and we had some people talking. Our, our pastor talked about it. Um, his wife, who has since passed, is um, of Jamaican heritage, and she was talking about how it was married, being married to a white man, and and all the stuff that she faced, and you know. So there were quite a lot of people, and it was quite emotive. I remember one of our um, junior pastors; he cried on stage. And this was all during lockdown, so we were watching it online, on television, on YouTube. Um, and it was so heavy, absolutely heavy. But then um, my church was quite supportive. We had like a, a, a support group um, and we talked about it and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, in terms of that, that aspect, it was, it was okay. But in terms of companies and stuff, I don't know. If I would give my, um, advice to my 26-year-old coming to the UK now um, would be to, to seize every opportunity, um, to not listen to other Zimbabweans. <laughs> because I remember when I first came, that was the thing. Oh, you can only do care work, you can only do care work, you can only do care work. I mean, yes, it was the easiest thing to get into because, and even now, 
um, there's quite a lot of Zimbabweans coming in through um, work visas that, that get them into care work. Um, so there's still quite a, a huge demand for people doing care work. But um, if you were coming, I would say that, you know, don't necessarily listen to what everybody is saying. Try and, try and do what you want to do because you just never know. Um, yeah, and there's, there's, there's quite a lot of opportunities out there. So, you know, you just need to seize that day. If I could, I'll be retired. <laughs> Wouldn't we all? Um, I would love to be retired um, and live somewhere warm. That's, that's my, that's, that would be nice. But five years is, is, is too small a time to, to have that into. But I think just, just, just where I am at the minute, comfortable and um, maybe the economy in the UK will be a little bit better as well and allow us to, to do other things as well. So, yeah. I would consider myself Zimbabwean. Um, I think, I don't know, I, I feel I'm still Zimbabwean. I don't, I don't know, I, as much as I've, like I said, I've, I've been here half and half of my life. Um, but because what I know is, and a lot of people talk about this, your formative years are your first sort of, you know, that's what you remember, that's what you know. So, you know, and in terms of like music and stuff like that, you stop thinking about music when you're like in your 20s. You know, that period is what will cover you up until you're in your 60s. And I've seen that with my dad, you know, or other older people when they think of, you know, when they're having their parties, whatever, they'll be playing music that they used to play in when they were in their 20s and 30s, stuff like that. So that sort of period has molded me and that's where I'm sort of, I don't want to say stuck, but that's in, in, yeah, that's where the roots are. So in my head, as much as, I don't, I don't know, yeah, I, I'm Zimbabwean, a core, you know. Um, but then when I go back to Zimbabwe, they say, oh, you're British, but you know, that's here and all there. <laughs>